Hello, and welcome to our program today, Afrocentricity. I'm your host, Michael Washington. We have a very special and creative program today entitled Jazz and Film. Our guest is the very brilliant and creative professor of communication, Dr. Stephen M. Weiss, who is going to begin our program with a uh, composition, a brief, a brief solo from the late composer Thelonious Monk. Uh, let's take it away, Dr. Weiss. <laughs> That was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I never get that kind of applause oh, at home. No, I'll no. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thelonious Monk, Blue Monk. Correct. Now, uh, Thelonious Monk was a piano player and a composer. Uh, why did you choose Thelonious Monk to play the saxophone? I mean, why not, uh, you know, one of the great saxophone players? Well, that's a good question. Thelonious Monk's important role in the history of jazz includes the fact that he brought up some of the greatest saxophonists in the modern jazz idiom, including John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Charlie Rouse, Johnny Griffin, just to name a few. And uh, the difficulty of his compositions, they're, they're uh, very deceptively simple but complex at the same time, is what makes them very attractive to horn players. He likes to work over traditional blues, harmonics, he likes to take the standard song form like I Got Rhythm and rework it in such a way to make it a real vehicle for the instrumentalist. And so saxophonists just love him and his harmonic freedom. And, and you, you're, a, you're a fan of Thelonious Monk yourself. I mean, you, you like his music, you like oh. his composition. Oh, I do, I love them. I think uh, he's kind of written uh, the corpus of the, the main modern jazz repertoire. As I say, they're very challenging. Some of them are very difficult to play. and difficult to master, and uh, they're, they're just, um, they are catchy. They are catchy compositions. They're unique and interesting compositions. And uh, apart from Ellington, he's probably the great, great, a single greatest contributor to the jazz composition. composition. Yeah. Now, you, you, uh, you know a little bit about Monk in terms of his personal life as well, I understand. You, uh, what can you say about uh, Thelonious Monk as a, as a person? As right. Well as a well, he's unique. You know, we always hear about jazz musicians, especially from the 40s and 50s, and about the lifestyle that they led, which was so wrapped up with drugs and problems with the law and so forth. But that was not really Thelonious Monk's uh, idiom. Uh, his idiom was he, he had this genius, this musical genius that kept him uh, going, but he also had a lot of uh, what we would probably describe now as psychological problems. Uh, he did not cope with the world in the way an ordinary person does. Uh, he uh, exhibited bizarre behavior sometimes. 
Uh, there's a story about him going to Europe on a tour and bringing back a whole suitcase full of empty Coke bottles. <laughs> uh, he was sometimes known to uh, go into a nightclub and while his saxophonist was soloing, he would just spin around in circles almost <laughs> endlessly. Um, he wore strange hats, strange jackets. Uh, it seems like he never wore the same hat twice. And he had a manner of speech which was um, very detached and almost made it seem as though he suffered from schizophrenia. Of course, that's not a clinical statement. That's just a, well, an son, observation. His son, his son made that observation, I yes. think, in the, the, the movie that uh, Clint Eastwood was the executive producer right. of Straight No Chaser. Right. I think his son made the observation that he would go into periods of euphoria and depression and his mother even knew, uh, Chad was her name, what was her name? I don't know the, her mother's his name, wife, yeah. His wife, and she, she, she knew how to cope with that. And right. She, she kind of uh, let the children know that you have to kind of protect your father right. in a certain sense. Yeah, and he of course, he also exhibited behaviors that we uh, attribute again to mental illness, a kind of helplessness, the need to be helped, to not know basically how to get where he was going. He had to be dressed and things of those nature. Well, he, I guess that, that's, that's a, a true genius then, huh? <laughs> I suppose, and I have heard other stories about people who have been great musical geniuses who were kind of helpless and outside that idiom of just being purely driven by the music, mm -hmm. were really not socially um, able to cope with the world. How did, how did Count Basie uh, uh, like, his, like his piano playing? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, the people that uh, Monk attributed as, as his influences are people that don't necessarily sound like him, mm -hmm. like some of the stride piano players, mm -hmm. as well as Duke Ellington, who was a favorite of his. And of course, he had a very angular style monk. Uh, for, uh, Count Basie had a much more uh, listenable style of jazz. It was jazz for the masses. And when he came up in the late 30s and 40s, um, people listened to uh, Basie because they could hear the melody, they could hear the sound of the tune. It was very hummable and repeatable. You know, that kind of da, 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 just very nice you thing. Do, you want to do that? <laughs> I'll save that. Okay. But, but, um, <laughs> but Monk, I think, uh, was somebody that the earlier jazz musicians probably had a little bit of difficulty approaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if the mutual respect was there. I think Monk probably did respect the Basie being, you know, one of the progenitors of the modern music. But I don't know if it was a mutual. Well, basically, uh, he got angry at Basie once, uh, at one time, and therefore kind of looking at him as he played. Or he yeah, actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a nice clip. Did you want, did you want to show that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's, uh, let's it's, it's from, can I set it up for you? It's yeah. from uh, Straight Note Chaser, which, by the way, is a collection of clips from Monk, from basically from the Columbia vaults in the 50s and 60s. And this was, uh, Columbia had a series on jazz, which they featured jazz musicians. and. They wanted to get Monk on there because his music was seen to be a little bit out there. They wanted to get him a little bit more of a popular audience. Well, he was one of, one of the one of the people who kind of got the whole bebop sound. Him. And That's Charles right. Parker. And then he kind of went into hiding for four or five years mm -hmm. and came out and was now. considered to be very advanced. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this clip, just to set it up, he's appearing, and the way they did it was they would always have the the, the next jazz musician who was on deck kind of sit there at the piano waiting and listening to the current guy. And the next guy that was up was Count Basie. So Basie's sitting there on a stool and he's listening to Monk. Okay. It's, it's, it's just, it's just that image itself is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at the, at the clip here if we can. Live television is the scariest medium of all because there's millions of people if you're going to act silly or you're going to be late, you're not going to show up, it's going to be a glaring omission. And uh, I just remember being very, very nervous. He sat down and he played. And I was aware of, of a real professional. There he is. He's, what's there to be nervous about? He's there.
On the way back, he was a little pissed off. At Count Basie, what did he say? He, he said, oh, Count Basie kept looking at him, or look, looking at him while he was playing. He was at the piano, and that somehow bothered him. He said, oh, you know, next time he plays somewhere, I'm gonna look at him. <laughs> to be... <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was an interesting, a very interesting clip. It was. <coughs> now, Thelonious would go on to live until 1982, but the last 10 years of his life, I don't think he even picked his horn up, did he? he, he didn't no, I, I saw a very late concert of his in the late 70s. Uh, a, a jazz producer put together a group called the Giants of Jazz, and basically, they took everybody who was from the bebop era, was still living, and put, put them on a tour. Sonny Stitt, Dizzy Gillespie, um, and, and, and uh, Thelonious Monk among them. They all still played great, uh, but the impression was that he was really even more and more detached, that he did suffer from mental illness, and then in the last few years, he, he was just physically unhealthy as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I understand, he, he died basically penniless. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the uh, concert in the late 70s. There was a famous movie shot, uh, a, a picture, and the whole movie made the, a great day in Harlem. Does that sound familiar to you? A great day in Harlem, where the famous uh, picture with all these jazz musicians. So, where, where, right. Where, where, where now that was not the 70s. That was that was in the that 50s. was in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, there's a, there was a um, photographer for Esquire magazine named Art Kane, and he mostly did glamour shots and celebrities and so forth. But he got an assignment to go out to Harlem, and shoot as many of the greatest living jazz musicians in the world as could be gathered. And uh, he managed to do this uh, at 10 o'clock on, on a certain morning. And uh, there's this wonderful, wonderful photograph that survives of them all assembled uh, on the stoop of, of basically an apartment house mm -hmm. in Harlem with the neighborhood kids and Count Basie and Dizzy Gillespie and scores, of, literally scores of jazz musicians. And, and the only ones who were absent from the picture are the ones who were either not in New York or were in tour in Europe at the time, mm -hmm. including Count, um, Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. excuse me. Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, was right. there. Archie Shepp, I guess he, he wasn't there. Yeah. Did, did he? he was, Archie Shepp, was, that was a little bit ahead of his time. Ahead of his time, okay, yeah. that was in the 50s, right? right. Archie Shepp came kind of in the About mid-60s, mid yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, <coughs> there was a whole movie made about that, wasn't there? And they there is, there's a short subject documentary, it's called A Great Day in Harlem, it was Academy Award nominated. Mm -hmm. It's about 30 minutes, and it just basically reconstructs that day of getting all those guys together. One of the funny things that's said about it is the fact that since they were all jazz musicians, they rarely got up before one or two in the afternoon. So mm -hmm. that for somebody to ask them to come up town for at 10 o'clock in the morning to take a picture, as Milt Hinton said, <laughs> these guys didn't even know there were two 10 o'clocks in a day. <laughs> so uh, th they got them all there somehow, and they all managed to look at the camera long enough to take the picture. And uh, it really is a great historic photograph. Now, <coughs> your class is, is entitled, the name of this program, Jazz and Film. Right. Uh, <coughs> Tell us a little bit about that class. I know you, do the students actually watch the movies, watch the films at Jazz? And <coughs> how many, I think I counted only about 10, uh, 10 movies with Jazz in it. And only only one of those, uh, maybe two, but one, I think, um, Alfie, 1965, right. that had nothing to do with Jazz per se. No. Uh, Michael Caine. Shelly right, it's a, it's a famous movie. Uh, it's a great movie. It's a movie that I recommend anybody watch just wanting to get good entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to answer those multiple questions, no. um, <laughs> the, the, the first thing I will say is my, my driving motivation behind the course was I wanted to look at two types of film in particular. One film were films about jazz musicians, whether real or fictional, whether um, uh, documentary or uh, just feature films. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to look at films where jazz, as part of the soundtrack, were centrally worked uh, was centrally worked in to the film. And there are good examples of both types. Now, you just asked me about Alfie. Alfie, apart from the fact that Sonny Rollins, a great tenor saxophonist, uh, post-bop saxophonist, wrote the film score and played the music. Other than that, there is no relationship between that film and jazz. The rest of the films are pretty straight about jazz. One is Bird, which is about Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. One is Round Midnight, which is based on the life of Bud Powell and Lester Young. Uh, 
mm -hmm. in the character of Dester Gordon, Gordon as Gordon a saxophonist. I thought he did a pretty good job. Well, he was nominated he for the award too, wasn't he? Best <coughs> Actor Academy Award, and yeah, that was, was a wonderful, wonderful film. Now, in my opinion, he was acting like himself, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> that's true, and, and uh, he had a lot of his own history <laughs> built into that character. That character was, was really a composite of him and those other two gentlemen mm -hmm. that I mentioned. Um, and then you have films which are fictional but really try to get at jazz music and the life of the jazz musician like Mo Better Blues, mm -hmm. Spike Lee, which is a wonderful film because it's beautifully filmed, beautifully acted with Denzel Washington. The music soundtrack is provided by Terrence Blanchard and uh, Branford Marsalis. So, I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's based on his own experience. Uh, Spike Lee's father is Bill Lee, who is a jazz musician himself. So he, he grew up school. with that music. Mm -hmm. right? <coughs> Spike Lee's sister, I think, in Plays Indigo, I think, didn't she? That's right. Yeah, and she's been in several of his films. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful film. Um, then, you know, some of the films are, are, are documentary subjects which deal with, like, This Great Day in Harlem, where there's a film, a very famous film, called Jazz on a Summer's Day, which was one of the very first jazz festivals that was put on film. It was the Newport Jazz mm -hmm. Festival in the late 50s. I guess that was the first one. That was, that was, that was more than... Um, about 12 years before Woodstock there, wasn't it? Right. And it's a very similar type of feel. It's a, it's a very atmospheric type of uh, movie. It shows you everything that's going on, not just the music. Mm -hmm. You know what the crowds are doing and the tourists. And right, even, even the boats. Right. Happening in the rich right. uh, area of right. uh, Newport, mm -hmm. Rhode Island. Um, in 1957, there was a movie starring Tony Curtis entitled uh, Sweet Smell of Success. Right. That was during the height, I suspect, of the bebop era. Uh, yeah, well, bebop really got started in the mid-40s. It was well established by the mid-50s. And as the mainstream of jazz, it was considered part of the main jazz um, idiom. Um, but there was another style of jazz called cool jazz, mm -hmm. which emanated in the 50s. It was an outgrowth of bebop. And the film that you mentioned, The Sweet, Smel Sel Sweet Smell of Success, um, that is a tongue twister, um, is a film in which the music of the Chico Hamilton Quartet is prominently featured. And Chico Hamilton was basically an East Coast musician who created a West Coast sound with his group. Uh, incorporated both the, uh, the cool sound of jazz, the West Coast sound of jazz with the bebop sound. And that's built into that story very nicely. <coughs> and the story itself is not so much about jazz. It, it is, it does it, it feature a jazz musician in the sense that one of the people is a guitar player. Right, it's about the publicist game in New York during the 1950s and how ugly it was and how people could destroy each other's careers by planning rumors about them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one of the lead characters who happens to be the villain, his sister is dating a jazz musician and that's how they worked in the Chico Hamilton group. Mm -hmm. Now, those film that you just talked about, are those the only ones or are there other ones that you just selected those 10 to 10? Because I know some, there, of your, some of your students wrote about uh, many of the film, but only those 10 seem to come up. Right. Well, uh, that was one of your other questions. We did watch 10 feature length films in that class, which is hard to do within the course of a semester. We had to take a lot of extra time and classroom space and so forth. Um, there are other films, but some of the other films are really they're, they're not v very faithful to the jazz tradition. As a matter of fact, they're myths. You know, there's this movie, Lady Sings the Blues, uh -huh. with Diana Ross right. playing Billie Holiday. And one would wonder, well, why isn't that film in there? I mean, the greatest jazz vocalist of the 20th century by most accounts, and why not a film about her? Well, the film has no basis in reality from what we understand, except for the fact that the character that Diana Ross plays is a drug addict. Other than that, it really doesn't reflect the recordings she made, the band she played with. It, it, it didn't sound like her singing. Uh, it didn't cover the whole range of her career. And uh, it didn't really cover the relationships she had with the real musicians during that time. So that's one that I left out. And there are other such biographies, like there's a biography of Benny Goodman, and there's a biography of Red Nichols, and other jazz musicians, which are really just Hollywood pieces. They're just designed to create two hours of entertainment very little historical. Now the contrast is that something like Bird that Clint Eastwood made, mm -hmm. he paid a lot of attention to the history and the facts mm -hmm. and researched it and used Bird's real play. So, so basically you want your course to reflect true jazz. Yeah, well one of my goals in the course uh, was to have my students learn about jazz in the context of learning how jazz appears in film. Mm -hmm. 
So I wanted them to know about the history of jazz, who the major figures of jazz, why, for example, is Thelonious Monk so important? Why does he show up so, so much in so many of these films? Why are so many guys playing his songs? Mm -hmm. But I also wanted them to know that film has a unique way of treating the jazz lifestyle and the jazz musician, and that it's a particular type of life that's worth examining. In many ca cases, a tragic life, mm -hmm. a short life, troubled, drug addiction, problems with money, with acceptance, depression, mental illness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, it, it makes good movies, but it can also be true. Mm -hmm. And that, that comes up quite a bit in Clint, Clint Eastwood's Bird, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, it shows you the flights of brilliance as opposed to the moments of absolute degradation where you know the guy is riding the subways with no money and uh, no future, really. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a guy who crammed a whole lifetime's worth of creativity into 15, 15 years. years. Mm -hmm. You know, from both of the time, he really didn't start playing professionally until he was about 20. He died at 35 years of age. Mm -hmm. In those 15 years, the output of, you know, maybe four or five decades worth of music. And the doctor thought he was 65 years old when he died. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's a story that's often told. That, that's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But that, that I think uh, Clint Eastwood also tried to show a little bit of the the racial problems at the time without focusing on that, but showing how, for instance, uh, 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 Red Rodney. Red Rodney. Uh, the, he was a Jewish player, apparently. Yes, I think he was, but he used that kind of Irish name. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he had, to, he had to be albino. Right, <laughs> albino red. It, it, it was a very comical event. Now, that's an event that I've never actually read in a in a history or biography as, as occurring, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that Clint Eastwood researched it well enough that that probably did occur, mm -hmm. and that Red Rodney was the source of that story. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that was interesting, the way that band was integrated, probably because it was from New York, and that was one of the few places that by the 40s had really integrated jazz bands, mm -hmm. it was possible. Mm -hmm. And the other thing it showed is that, that Red Rodney uh, was so, I guess, enamored by the style, the persona, the man, Bird, that he began to do the drug thing right. himself, and Bird didn't like that and didn't right. want him to do that. You know, that's something that's kind of hard for for me to understand, but I guess at the time, you know, people heard Charlie Parker play, and they said, if that's how he plays and he shoots drugs, then I want to shoot drugs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, that meant that there were a lot of dead copycats. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about the course. I want uh -huh. people to, uh, to take the course. I sure. want people out here in, uh, in the community to hear how wonderful this course is. First okay. of all, um, you, you, I know you taught it once before. Right. And you want to teach it again. Right, I'd like to do it every other year, uh, obviously because there are new things that come along in the film area that we can examine. And uh, it's just the kind of course that's so interesting to me with my love of jazz that I could come back to over and over again. And I noticed that the students, uh, you, you shared with me several projects that mm -hmm. the students uh, did, and each project was different. It was. So uh, how do you, how do you, what are the nature of the assignments in this course? Well, the unifying thing was that I wanted them to appreciate the films as if they were movie reviewers. In other words, I wanted to approach them not as just uh, historical or about jazz or as examples of jazz. I wanted them to say, I'm going to the movies, I'm an expert critic, and I've seen this film about jazz, I want to respond to it. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. what I wanted to have our students do eventually was create a portfolio of reviews of films about jazz and have that represent kind of a reader's guide to films about jazz. Mm -hmm. So if you went to the bookstore and you pick up this book, which was called The Best Films About Jazz, you'd read these reviews and you'd know which ones you'd want to see and not want to see. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. So I wanted them to achieve a rhetorical purpose in addition to learning about the jazz. So the student comes to the course, mm -hmm. they watch a movie. Correct. The movie is, it plays. Well, there's always a setup, by the way. We always spend the whole class saying, here's a movie about Charlie Parker. Let me tell you all about Charlie Parker. And I'll even bring my sax to class and I'll say, here's some songs Charlie Parker made famous in the history of jazz. Let uh -huh. me play a couple for you. And then we watch the film, because they have to understand who this person is, how significant he is. Mm -hmm. And then we spend the whole, class unpacking the film, you know, responding to it. How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, is it, what does it say to you that somebody with this much genius is this unrecognized and dies this destitute? You know, mm -hmm. 
And so it's a lesson about life, too. Yeah. Do they do any reading, though, in, in, in essence, uh, to prepare them? On their own, I send them out to research oh, the, I see. the individual, sure. I see. So but, they, but no books. No it's books. a great class in that regard. No textbooks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so, so you, you, it's not a test. You don't even give them a test. You make them No, it's all writing. Reviews. Lots of writing. They write about <laughs> 10 very substantial essays by the end of the class. And, and this course is taught in the communication department. Correct. And it's taught as a, is it, it's a, Journalism? What it would well, we did it as a special topics in okay. communication, and you could take it in all of our divisions, journalism, speech communication, radio and television, and as a popular culture minor mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. now, so it covered a lot of bases. Okay, and we, we're gonna, we want to offer it again pretty soon, especially if we can get a lot of demand from this, from this program. Sure. Now, the students actually, uh, are they coming to the course as people who are interested in jazz? Why would they take the course? Well, I asked them that the first day of class. And some of them said, I'm interested in jazz, but I don't know anything about it. Some say, I love jazz, but I really just know that when I hear it, it sounds good, but I don't know who I'm listening to or why that sounds good and mm -hmm. something else doesn't. Um, others, I think, were just exploring. They said, you know, I'll give it a, tr a try. I've never listened to that or heard it. But I think they really, they really grew to appreciate it. And a lot of my students have come back to me over and over again and said, you know, I'm still listening to jazz. Uh -huh. You know, in the same way that Ken Burns, who was never a jazz lover, right. made that documentary about jazz. Right. And when he was done, he said he listens to it all the time. All the time now. It's the kind of thing you can school yourself to appreciate. And we only got about a minute or so left. What do you think about that Ken Burns uh, documentary on jazz? I think it was very good, very long, my personal perception. <laughs> but I didn't notice any, any guitar players. <laughs> guitar players. Uh, well, uh, I think we could make a whole documentary about the weaknesses of Ken Burns jazz, uh -huh. but let me say one very good thing about it, and that is it brought jazz to a whole generation of people who really have never experienced it. Mm -hmm. And if you were willing to sit down and commit yourself to that program for however many weeks it was, you really did learn a lot. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is, and people will never be happy with a program like that because it was so encyclopedic, are the omissions. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, when I see a program on the history of jazz that doesn't mention Chick Corea, mm -hmm. I'm very disturbed. Wes Montgomery. Wes Montgomery, Keith Jarrett. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I think, the failing. And a lot of people say that it's the gospel according to Wynton Marsalis. That's mm -hmm. the criticism. Mm -hmm. But Wynton Marsalis is an important man in the jazz community. And Louis, Louis Armstrong is certainly an important man, and Duke Ellington is certainly an important man. You can't take that away from him. But I thought that, and I don't, I, I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful documentary. Mm -hmm. Our time is winding down, and we only have about 10 seconds left. Um, and I don't, I don't want to comment negatively about it, but I, I did like to see uh, the influence of the guitarist <laughs> in, that, in that particular clip. This has been a wonderful interview. Dr. Stephen M. Weiss, uh, lover of jazz, professor of communication, and a brilliant man. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you Stephen, for, for agreeing to our, our interview here. My this pleasure. has been Afrocentricity, Michael Washington. Until next time, have a wonderful day.